Uh, buenos dias. That'll be the last Spanish that I, that I say, I think. Um, hello, good morning. Um, and uh, I want to thank uh, uh, everyone for who arranged this, uh, and Conasit, and, uh, uh, and 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 all the kind people who've uh, who've helped helped uh, make this happen. Um, I um, before before we start, I, I like to get a little show of hands um, as uh, as to who who is in the audience. Um, do we have any scientists in the audience? Okay, a few. The scientists are all in the front row, so that tells you something. Um, do we have any people who are journalists, general interest journalists, not specifically science journalists, but general interest journalists? Okay, and okay, we have a few. Okay, thanks. And um, is there anyone here who, uh, so I guess the rest of you are the rest of you science writers or science journalists. Yeah, okay, good. Mainly science journalists. Okay. Um, well, I wanted to... Um, uh, no, one, one more question. Um, of the science journalists, how many of you have studied uh, science writing or journalism in school in a formal pr academic program? Okay, not very many of you, actually. All right. Okay. Um, well, first I want to start telling you a little bit about Scientific American so you'll know where, where I'm coming from. Um, th this is our current, the, the cover of our current issue. Uh, King of Beasts. How our weak, defenseless ancestors became Earth's dominant predator. Um, and that's a, you know, that's really, uh, you know, really typical of the kind of cover stories we have. Uh, that appeal really directly to our core readers of science enthusiasts, you know, people who are not scientists themselves, and most of our readers are not scientists, uh, only maybe 10%. Um, and uh, most of them, you know, we, most of them are, are people who know something about science. Maybe they've had a science, kind of a science education in school, but they're just really, they're really enthusiastic and really excited about science, and they come to us because they want, they want more than they can get elsewhere. Um, we have a we have a, a, a circulation a subscriber circulation of about five hundred thousand, um, and our 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 pass along readership is about three million. Uh, so we, we figure three million people are looking at the magazine every month, um, and um, we're we're very proud of uh, of of this current design. Uh, we um, we. Uh, were uh, nominated uh, uh, in 2010. We were nominated for, for the first time in the magazine's history uh, by the American Association of Magazine Editors for a, a General Excellence Award, which is just given to the best magazines uh, in their categories. And we won, uh, which was really wonderful. And and we were nominated again in 2012 for general excellence for the magazine. And that was really great. We didn't win it that year, but we were, it was good to be in the running. But um, I tell my, uh, my colleagues, um, and where we tell each other, that if all we ever did was publish a really great magazine, the best magazine on science um, in the English language, uh, we would, we, that would still not be enough. Because as you know, journalism is changing, the magazine business is changing, and it's become very challenging. So, so what we have to do is we have to be leaders on the digital front. And, um, and, uh, and that's what we've done. That's what we've tried to do. I'm just going to show you. I don't know if it's going to work. No. No. Oh. Oh, dear. There we go. This is this is the um, this is the table of contents of the same issue. Just to give you an idea for for the feature well, those are those are those are feature articles that run at length in the middle of the magazine. Um, they they're uh, about uh, roughly half of them are written by journalists, and the other half are written by scientists. Uh, and so we invite scientists to uh, give us. Uh, 
proposals, and we 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 discuss these proposals at great length, and we decide how exactly the story is is going is go, what what it's going to be about. We clarify so that we are are we are crystal clear on what the story is going to be about, and we put a lot of work in the front end of stories, um, and I, which I think is really the most important part. If you if you are very clear in the beginning what a story is about then the rest of it will come go a lot easier. And then uh, for our expert authors, uh, for our scientists, we do heavy editing. Uh, you might even call it rewriting. Um, and uh, and we, uh, some people were talking about uh, yesterday about a tension that exists between scientists and, uh, and journalists. Uh, well, that, that tension really, uh, the rubber really hits the road uh, when we're editing scientists because they have one idea often, uh, most, I mean 90% of the scientists who write for us are, are very grateful and, 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 and appreciate what we do. Uh, once in a while, you know, we, we have disagreements, but uh, we, we negotiate them. Uh, but we, you know, we, we believe very very strongly that uh, scientists are the experts in their what, their subject, but we are the experts in how to present this material. We are the experts in how to write a good headline, how to write, how to how to how to package the material so that people can understand it. And um, you know, this is it's it's very easy to get intimidated because uh, when you're a journalist, because you know what do you, what do we know? I mean, we don't know anything. Uh, you know, we know what scientists tell us. But uh, but we actually do know a lot of things. We know we know how, uh, and especially when you've been, you know, been in the business for um, 150 years, like I have, uh, you know you, you begin to you know you you begin to figure out how to do this. Um, and that's the other part of our table of contents. Those are all the departments. Uh, you know, the short things we have. Uh, science agenda is a. Uh, th this has been very successful for us. This is a house editorial. So we 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 sit down at once a month and we say what what's really in the news? What is topical? What uh, what what issue of science? Um, is in the news. It's a matter of policy. Uh, it's, it's, it's something we can call out for a, a specific action that, uh, that should be taken. What, what can we recommend that the government needs to do or business leaders need to do or whoever? And uh, and then and then whoever whoever comes up with the winning idea, uh, you know the the the, the, uh, the old saw no good deed goes unpunished. Well, that person gets to write it for that month, and um, and we have won uh, to a year and a half ago we won a um, science and society award for this editorial, which I was, uh, for, for one of them, it was on chimp testing. And we came out uh, pretty early uh, um, uh, and, and, and called for a ban on, ch on chimp testing, or a ban on most chimp testing. And, um, I, and, we, and I was particularly proud of that award because these are very hard to pull off, you know. Uh, I, I mean, it's very hard to write uh, or edit by committee, and yet, here we are, we meet, we decide as a group what to write. And so we write it and then it gets passed around to the entire group and everybody has, uh, has their say. And then to, but then to come out in the end with a really compelling and coherent essay um, uh, out of that process I think is, is, is really, really an accomplishment. And um, you know, I think the way we do that is once, once we settle on the idea, the person who writes it the person, that person writes it. This was the one that we won the uh, award for for chimp testing was written by Kate Wong, who's a really beautiful writer. And you know, we, we all made comments, but it was her piece. And it, appear, it appeared without her byline. It appeared just as, as a house editorial. Um, we have, uh, let's see, I can't read that. We have a, a sec we have columnists. We have a section called advances, which are short pieces. We have a, a column called science of health, which is which is which I'm another one I'm really proud of. This, this go this looks at the science behind health, um, and it and uh, it it. it it, you know, the, you re, you read you'll read a study that says you know don't eat you know if you eat bread you'll get fat and then you'll eat, you'll eat another study that says if you eat bread you, you'll get skinny. Um, you know, I'm, I'm making that up, but that you know pe people are you, you feel like you get uh, whiplash reading health health uh, uh, studies and they, that seem to contradict each other. 
Well, this, this here, you're trying to have a single idea, a single focus. Well, this column actually shows you nuance. It's, it's really kind of a, 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 a you know, it, we, we try to actually, uh, uh, sh you know, show you the complexities behind health trends. Um, and we have a techn technophiles column by David Pogue, which is very helpful, which is very uh, popular, uh, and, and, and et cetera. Um, now, like I said before, if we continue to publish, not, do nothing but publish a really great magazine, that wouldn't be enough. So we, we're trying to publish a really great website too. And this is our home page. It got cut off at the top. It says Scientific American, but uh, this is our main, you know, our main area for stories that are toward the left that we that we curate. So that's all done by hand. All those stories are pulled up, and then the ones on the right, they kind of they kind of run up. Uh, you know, there's a feed, and they kind of they kind of run up by themselves automatically. Um, our our website uh, four ish years ago. Uh, these numbers uh, don't 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 quote me on these numbers, but um, it was something like a, a million and a half unique visitors a, a month, and we're now over five uh, million unique visitors a month. So we've we've our 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 web traffic has ramped up considerably. And that's because, we, partly because we've gotten our entire staff engaged in working on the web. We used to have a print staff and then a, a poor beleaguered uh, web staff who do, you know, they were, you know, were churning out stories. And now we have everybody uh, churning out stories and everybody working for the magazine. So we have a little cross-pollination going on and, and, and we're, we're always looking for ways of, of, of uh, using, you know, using both platforms um, uh, to, to really figure out where do, where does the real where do the good stories want to go because we're we are storytellers is what that is our main fo our, the main thing that we do we tell stories we happen to tell stories about science which is a particular involves a particular skill but we tell we want it, we tell stories and where do these stories want to go do they want to go do they need to go up right away do they need to be read right away can they wait four months would they benefit from waiting four months um, the, which is our, our lead time on the print magazine. So that, those are the kind of things we think about. Now, so we, 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 so we have the news and we're also bringing in partner content. So uh, we have uh, content partners um, that we will use, that we will use their materials. So, uh, uh, you know, Nature News, for example, Nature is, uh, na Nature is, uh, 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 we, we have the same parent company as Nature. And so we will, we will run Nature News stories as our own. We will put them on our site, they'll say Scientific American, but there'll be a byline and it'll say, you know, Nature News. Um, and this allows us uh, to get a lot more content on our site. And it also frees up our journalists to focus on the stories, the ones who we have on staff, and the ones that we have as valued freelancers to focus on the stories that, that we really can add value. And figuring out what that is, is <laughs> that, that's, the, that's the challenge. Um, but then you'll also see, you know, we're, we're doing, we've got videos and podcasts we do. We've got a whole blog network uh, uh, that's been very successful. Uh, we've got, I'm looking, I'm reading around off the top in that bar. You know, we have, we have a bunch of education offerings like Bring Science Home. So we, we publish uh, experiments and things that you can do uh, uh, to, to in your kitchen or in your classroom. And um, uh, we have uh, citizen science uh, projects that, uh, you know, you know, one of the biggest trends these days in, in science is uh, scientists using uh, ordinary people to gather data. Uh, you know, and uh, you know, birds. I mean, there are all these birds out there. Uh, so many birds, so few scientists. And uh, and and then you have these crazy bird watchers who run out and they they get an app and they're, you know, they get all psyched because they're they're helping. They're actually entering data that gets put in a database and it's used actually for real science. So it's very exciting, and we think that. That's you know that's a uh, we would like we would like to be the place where people come for that kind of thing, um, and then we have uh, and we have other things, but um, I, I want to keep it moving here. Um, I'm kind of not sure where we're ah there we go all right that's a good place to stop that's supposed to be Mexican science. <laughs> um, so that leads, oh, and one other thing, the website, I just want to tell you that in 2012, when we were nominated for General Excellence for the magazine, we were also nominated for General Excellence for the website. We did not win, 
but we were up among the four or five finalists. Now that was really, really awesome for us because uh, you know our, our our website has had such a dramatic improvement, and it will you know we've got plans for the future, um, and I hope, hope it continues to, to to go that way. Um, okay. Um, I want to sort of uh, I want to well I want to leave lots of time for questions so, but. Um, uh, because I was uh, I had the, the, lo the lovely dinner last night uh, with the dancing and the and the um, and the those that wonderful food, um, uh, I was talking to some folks uh, and and it sounds like <laughs> there are a lot of questions, <laughs> so I want I want to leave a lot of time for that. Um, but let me let me just uh, I would like to make one point first, um, and I um, I was. Um, I was uh, before I was at Scientific American. I was at Newsweek magazine, uh, and I was editing science there. And then I went on and I was doing some other things as well. Um, and um, before that, I worked briefly at uh, at IBM Corporation, and uh, it was 22 months, um, and it was very interesting. It was a real learning experience, and. Oddly enough, the thing that I learned at IBM, I think the, the thing that I learned, the, the one big lesson I got at IBM, was, uh, was that writers have, can have a big effect on culture, uh, on, on the way society works, on what, what society does. And, and I, in, in the microcosm of a corporation, well, IBM is a pretty big corporation, but, uh, but it, 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 in, that, in that culture, uh, at the time I worked there, IBM was, uh, this was back in the, uh, back in the, in the, in the uh, right around about 1998, and IBM had just been coming off a really terrible time. Uh, it had been king of the world, it had almost, you know, almost a monopolist, um, you know, it had uh, still selling mainframe computers, and, that's, and, and then came microprocessors and cut the whole business model out from under it. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Um, and so they were, you know, they were reeling and management changes, and, and I don't think they called them layoffs in those days. They had some other euphemism for them, um, uh, you know, early retirement, I guess. Um, they were reducing their workforce. They were trying to figure out who they were. Who are we? What do we do? What is our purpose? You know, uh, and I don't remember what the original purpose was, you know, I don't know, keep building box, you know, big pieces of equipment and making lots of money, I guess. Um, um, but then the, when the money stopped rolling in, they had, to, they had to look inward and figure out who they were. What are we? And um, a, a guy there named John Awada uh, uh, was uh, uh, a young, uh, really smart, rising guy. And he, he was in the internal communications department. And I, when I went there, I actually wound up working for John. Um, but, but before I got there, he had come up with this pamphlet. And it was called One Voice. And I, I don't, you know, I never kept a copy of One Voice, but I really wish I had it. But this was a very simple document, and it very, it laid out a vision. Someone's nodding here. Do you, do you remember this? Do, do you remember One Voice? Is that, do we have any ex IBMers here? No? Okay. Um, they, they came out with this pamphlet called One Voice, and it basically, in very clear language, and using, using uh, language, using visuals, um, they came out with a, a, a story about what IBM was. And it was so powerful. You know, you had salesmen who were asking for copies of this. Oh, I want to hand this out to my clients. You know, people were, these things, they would print these things, and then they would disappear, and they would have to print more. And, uh, this really had a big, a, a big effect on, on the corporate culture, and it helped, I think, helped turn IBM around. And uh, the the head of IBM Communications at the time would always talk about, you know, uh, you know, about uh, communications people in our humble profession, and uh, because in a in a corporate culture, you know, the communications people are not are not the stars, you know, we're the, you know, we or they or the handmaidens, you know, the, 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 the engineers at IBM are the ones who do the real work and the salesmen are the ones who bring in the money, et cetera, et cetera, but the communications people, well, they come in afterwards and they mop up and they, you know, they make sure they, they write the press releases are okay. But actually at IBM, the communications people really helped shape what the company was about. Now, 
my, my feeling is that that's what journalists do in the, in the larger culture. I think that is really what we do. I think um, we are agents of change. Um, and uh, uh, people, I mean, I mean we, we, all, we all think of uh, the role of journalists, and we're all aware of the, the importance of journalists in a democracy, um, uh, and you know, the, the, the importance of having an informed electorate. Um, but when things are changing quickly, um, it's a little bit more complicated than just informing an electorate. You actually have to, to you have you have to be an agent of change. And um, I mean, I don't think I don't. This doesn't mean, and I'm not saying that journalists need to go on a crusade. That journalists need to be activists. That I really don't believe that. Well, I, I some journalists are activists, and they do fine, and and that's what they do. Uh, that's not how I think of journalism. I, I think of journalism as uh, as a, a way of uh, of telling stories that that are helpful and true, and science journalism. Um, science journalism, the great thing about science journalism is that you're dealing with evidence. So, uh, you know, when you're a political journalist, you're quoting politicians, you're trying to figure out what's going on, the world is chaotic. In science journalism, the great thing that you learn how to do is you learn how to deal with evidence. What is the evidence for this? You know, because you're writing about, when you're writing about a study, um, uh, you, you know, it's kind of obvious, well, how good is the study, how good is the data, blah, blah, blah. But when you're, you can also write about things that, that inf you can have a question and then you can find out what science, how science informs that question. And that's a really great discipline because then you're looking for evidence. You're looking not for somebody's opinion, you're looking for what are, what, what are, what is factual. And that's a very powerful thing. And so that gives you, um, say things about the world that, that people should listen to. Um, okay, now where am I going with this? Uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna bravely go to the next slide. Oops. Okay. Now this is, yeah, this is IBM. This is IBM Un Planeta Mas Intelligente, uh, a smart planet. This was, this was one of the ideas. The, um, uh, I, my, my old buddies uh, back at IBM came up with that slogan, and it was, it was a defining moment when they came up with it. In the communications department, by the way. And that's, uh, you know, that, I mean, there's more to it than that. You have to, you know, when you come up with a slogan like that, you have to articulate how that, what that means to all parts of the company. But, um, you know, that's just an example of the power of these things. Um, now, it, just in case, you know, in case you're wondering, you know, what, else, what, what is out there in the purview of scientists that needs, that needs some new messaging, right? Uh, you know, we, we're, we're, all, uh, we're all dealing with um, people who hold opinions that are not supported by evidence. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a sweet spot for us. Um, here's another one. This is one of my favorite ones. Teach the controversy. You know, I love that. Uh, about intelligent design in, in, in classrooms. Uh, intelligent design versus uh, evolution. Those are two equal theories on an equal footing. Yeah, right. Okay, so this is, um, this is a story that we ran uh, recently uh, in, in our October issue. Uh, it was written by a really great writer, uh, Eric Vance, uh, who's, uh, who's based in Mexico City. He's American. Um, and this is part of an annual uh, uh, package that we do called the State of the World Science. So we, we look at uh, what is what? Where? What, what's the state of the world science? Uh, how? What is? What are? What are the big issues in science around the world? We try to be really international in perspective. Um, and uh, this year, this year we focused on innovation more more so than basic science. And um, this this is an article by Eric, who took a look at uh, uh, Mexican science and tried to figure out um, why more Mexican science isn't making its way to, uh, to the real world, to, to, you know, to, uh, to companies that do technology uh, and that bring in a lot of revenue and, and employ people. And, 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 and he found, a, a, and, he, and, he, and he reported this out really well. He, he focused on a company called Biohominus, but that was uh, given money by the government. It was. It was. It was. It had. A, it had a, assembled a really great team of uh, of experts, 
and um, uh, they, they, they foundered on uh, really, really red tape. Um, it was it was a lot of it was a lot of weird tax laws and uh, and but they also but Eric also found that there were there were a lot of cultural roadblocks to uh, to taking science in the lab and 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 making it work in the marketplace and uh, and. Uh, you, you know, these a lot of these things are attitudes. A lot of them are habits. A lot of them are, you know, what w w you know, w what are the, what are the things that we value? And if you're in academia, do you value the fact that you uh, are uh, you started a startup company that is selling a product based on some chip that you invented uh, or some technology you invented? Um, and he you know he, he found that that basically wasn't in va va valued. It was actually discouraged. So people, you know. Pe there were people in academia who were ostracized for doing something in the commercial world. So uh, this is what I mean by culture. And um, the current um, administration in Mexico has made a big priority. Science is a big priority. That's why we're here, I, I'm told. Um, but in part because there's a, you know, uh, there, there's a push to raise the profile of science and to really get that engine of innovation going in this country. Um, and I am very encouraged by the fact that uh, part of that push is a gathering of science writers because um, uh, th 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 these cultural uh, cultural changes need to need to happen. They can't happen in a vacuum. They can't happen if no one knows what's going on. And and if you all write about it, you know that's that's you, you can you can you can play a big role in 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 bringing bringing these kind of changes about. Um, Man, I'm not having very, very consistent with this thing. That's a really good slide. Oops. Okay. Well, maybe that's it. Maybe that's the, the end of my slides. Um, and I, 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 I um. I think what uh, I, I don't. I, I'm not speaking about Mexico in particular. I'm speaking about journalism in general these days. When I say that I, I think you know, I think what journalism needs now is money. I think journalism needs a viable business models for publications so that uh, to support the kind of things that, that science writers do um, and journalists in general do. I think that's the real big crisis in science journalism right now is that the business models that supported it in the past are, uh, are, 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 are in trouble and we need to find new ones. And that's what we're trying to do and uh, I hope that uh, you know, I hope that that's uh, that's successful in general because I think that uh, the, the work that you're doing, uh, you know, the way to, you know to look at the world and figure out what's what's going on and and write about it is really a fundamental fundamentally important thing. And um, I have to say that I you know a couple of years ago I. I in a moment of weakness, oh, around about 2007, I uh, uh, I was having lunch with a young writer who had come in from London, and we were, you know, we were we were catching up, and I <laughs> I don't remember what had happened that day, but I looked at her and I said, "It's still t you you still have time to go to medical school or something like that, you know," and uh, and it was uh, it was a really a moment of weakness. I don't I'm not usually like that, but I could see the blood drain from her face, and I had to quickly. Say no, no, no! You're really talented. I'm not telling you that you should get out of journalism. I'm just saying. Um, but but since then, you know, I've been really encouraged. I, I've really come around. Uh, I've, been, I've been encouraged by the, by the young people who are going into this field, who who um, who are doing it because they love it, because they love to tell tell stories, because they want to do something they care about. They want to do something that's fun. They're interested in the world, and and. And I was the same way. I mean, I didn't, you know, I, I knew journalism didn't pay the big bucks, but I did it anyway. I mean, I was, you know, what can I say? And that's why I think you all are doing it. And, and I just really want to applaud that and thank you. And it's uh, it's really been the best thing to happen to me personally is to is to be able to work with you all and talk with you all. So um, with that, um, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.